instead of taking you through the readings one by one as I did in the last lecture, this lecture will cover themes you will read and research over the next several weeks. When a professor is designing a course, they can do so in a number of different ways. But in this case, it made the most sense to take a thematic approach to the coverage of what I consider to be some of the salient issues in corrections. You'll see in weeks two and three that you're covering important issues in corrections, including the psychology of imprisonment, living and working in prison, legal issues in corrections, and special correctional populations, including sex offenders, the elderly, and some gender-specific issues. By rights, we could spend an entire course on any or all of these topics. Each in their own right are important and complex issues that have significant impact on how the system operates. Prisons are societies very much like the ones we live in. The primary difference is that prison societies are comprised of like people, that is, people who've been found guilty of a crime. The larger society we live in is much more diverse, isn't it? And if prisons are societies, and they are, they have rules and standards and methods of formal and informal social control. For many people, they want those who have broken the law to be imprisoned. Perfectly understandable. But in many cases, people do not give a prison a second thought, and they should. While it is nice to think that the bad guy is off the street, the place where the bad guy is being housed for the four years he is off the street has a significant and direct impact on how he views the world. This is the psychology of imprisonment. This is a real and important phenomenon, and one that we as a larger society must consider, given the number of people we incarcerate, and therefore the number of people released from prison to the community on a regular basis. We are short-sighted as a society if we do not consider the ramifications of locking someone up in prison and how that impacts them while they are incarcerated and when they are released. Working off the premise that prisons are societies in and of themselves, we must explore in some detail the inner workings of that society, how it functions, and what the power dynamics are between the citizenry of that society. Prison society is comprised of inmates and workers. The guards, as well as the inmates, are the citizenry of the prison world. Therefore, it behooves us to take a moment to explore the inner workings of the relationship between these two groups. Prisons were created to deprive one group of liberty. That would be the inmate. In order to do this well, this requires constant and continued oversight by another group. That would be the guards. Therefore, power relationships form the foundation of the prison world. Take special notice of how each group, both inmates and guards, attempts to exert power over the other, and how, until fairly recently, the ability of the guards to abuse that power was unlimited. Once we have established the macro-level function of the prison, that is, prison as a society, we need to take a micro-level view of who the prison houses. While prisons may be homogeneous in the sense that they incarcerate people who have been found guilty, it is there that the similarities end. No inmate is created equal, and inmates have different needs and different issues that require nuanced management. The Get Tough push in the 80s and 90s has resulted in more people going to prison for longer periods of time. This, in turn, has resulted in the graying of the prison population. Understanding that most people in prison were not in the best of health when they were incarcerated, that is, they likely did not have good access to health care or were not covered by insurance, inmates in prison are are costing states more money than ever as they spend more time behind bars with serious and often chronic diseases. Folks like to say that the health care in prison is better than it is on the outside. My response is usually to say that I would much rather pay to have someone's sexually transmitted disease or HIV treated in prison than allow them to spread the disease on the inside and then ultimately on the outside when they leave. Specialized offender populations also require special care. Whether we are discussing women in prison, offenders with mental health deficits, or sex offenders, each of these types of offenders, as well as others, requires a specific level and type of care. In particular, I want to take a minute to discuss sex offenders. Keep in mind that there are plenty of people in prison who are technically sex offenders, but because of plea bargaining, and remember, 99% of cases are plea bargained, were not charged as such. These are the folks that get out after a few years in prison and return to our communities. These are the sex offenders nobody likes to talk about. In contrast, sex offenders in prison for a sex offense engender much talk, 
hang them high, send them to a remote island, castrate them, etc. We have all heard it all. But with few exceptions, and I'm talking about those who are civilly committed, these sex offenders will also leave prison and move back to our communities. The treatment and counseling that they receive in prison can be beneficial to some, despite what most people think. So as you can see, reading through your week two and three readings, keep the following in mind. Prisons no doubt serve a purpose, but they have real psychological and physiological implications for those who live and work there. Coupled with differences in gender, crime type, and health concerns, prisons are complicated places with complex needs under constant scrutiny. Hopefully, a more nuanced understanding of the myriad issues facing prison will provide you with a healthy respect and appreciation for the people who work there and an informed view about the people who live there.